know for 22 years now, I've worked for National Geographic uh, as a contributing photographer. And they've sent me to every continent all over the world. The number one question I get, believe it or not, when I go out and speak, people say, have you ever come close to getting killed on assignment? One lady asked me if I ever had been killed on assignment. <laughs> Not quite yet, but I've been in uh, airplanes that have gone into high-speed stalls where the pilot started screaming and wet himself. That's bad in a pilot. Uh, I've had <laughs> muskox charge me and had polar bears trying to figure out how to get into the rusty Chevy van I was driving that wouldn't start for about an hour. That's, that's not good, too. But most of the time, you know what? It's just bugs that bite you. Most of the time, it's just bugs. You're looking at the feet of a photographer who was very desperate to make a picture on the North Slope after three days of getting skunked. That's what you'll do to make a great frame for National Geographic. Why? Because we're all freelance, and we're afraid we're going to fail and starve and die in that order. So <laughs> anything it takes, anything it takes. The other question I get all the time is, how do you get a job with National Geographic? That's got to be a lot of fun, isn't it? Well, for me, I started out, I went to the University of Nebraska, where the N stands for knowledge. That's right. And, um, <laughs> and I, uh, and I took pictures of the things that I thought were interesting or different, you know, like a cowboy roping a cat or, or a bad dog. You know, bad dogs are really good for pictures. Some dogs are a little worse than others, I guess. <laughs> but I just took the kind of pictures I thought were fun or interesting or different, and I've been doing it ever since. I did a story for, for the Geographic on America's State Fairs not long ago. Garrison Keillor was the writer, and, and uh, I just looked for the weird stuff, like the Midway Barker at the Texas State Fair. He's six foot four and standing upright. That's a mirror illusion, you can't tell. The very creepy mother-daughter look-alike contest at Iowa was <laughs> always nice. Very good, Iowa also has a very good hypnotist act, if you wanna see that. Drove all the way to Indiana for their cockroach tractor pull. <laughs> always fun. Out of all of them though, this was my favorite thing to photograph. This is the slingshot ride at Minnesota. And, what, and I put a, a remote fired camera inside this cage. It shoots people up about 200 feet. They pull three or four Gs. What I loved about it most though is the ride operator put a live microphone inside that cage and he broadcasts on the midway all the filth and obscenities people scream. The, the more scared they are, the longer, they lo longer the line, of course. Well, you know, as I, as I go along, I have to tell you about the love and support of my family. My wife, Kathy, of many years, has been there for me all the way along. That's how I'm able to do what I do. My grandmother, who's 90 in the nursing home, she's always very, very helpful. We sneak Jack into her once in a while. Uh, and I have three beautiful kids that are, that are very supportive. My oldest son, Cole, ruining a perfectly good evening as a toddler. Middle daughter, Ellen, very upset. She, uh, she taught me, though, that the camera can be a very good disciplinary tool, actually. When you break it out, she'd shape right up. So it's a wonderful thing if you want to try to discipline kids. It worked on, on the first two, but it never did work well on my third child, Spencer. He's more of a bad seed, I guess. He's kind of a professional fit thrower. He throws fits at home. Uh, he throws <laughs> he throw fits in restaurants routinely. Uh, it could be Easter Sunday. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter. So, of course, it's all the same pattern setting up here, you know. So, of course, we carry this over into our Christmas card. Every year we do a Christmas card that involves some sort of humor. This was an early one. It's been three weeks. Santa's got to go. <laughs> one year we formed a cult for our Christmas card. <laughs> got me a little wife there, evidently. Uh, the year after that, we were so late getting our Christmas card out, we were really late. Christmas is over by the time we finally got it shipped. <laughs> you never really want to give a Browning 12-gauge shotgun to a fit thrower. And they get worse, by the way. There's two more and they get worse. I, uh, when, we, always have, we all struggle with how to do this card. We struggle with, and I thought, well, I woke up one morning with this line in my head. I thought, I can illustrate this. We just can't quit you, old Saint Nicotine. <laughs> There's one more and it's a lot worse than this one, by the way. So we had some health problems in our family last year and people wondered whether we'd even do a card. And I said, let's go ahead and do a card. We already got a picture of the worst moment of the whole year. Let's just send that out. Just a baby Ruth bar. 
or is it a Baby Ruth book? All right, we should talk about conservation a little bit, shouldn't we? You know, when I go out and do these conservation stories, I'm doing it the same way. I'm just looking for interesting, weird, funny, odd pictures. I did a story on grizzly bears. I had, you know, eight weeks over the course of a calendar year. It's big and epic, and I noticed it was going to be a very long assignment. These are my boots up the tree on day two of the assignment. You notice the tops of my boots are wet. Don't ask why. These are trained bears for the movie industry. There's a, this bear is just keeping his mouth open, waiting for a donut hole to be tossed in. That's it. They're trained bears to roar and maul for the movie industry. And so I spent one week out of my precious eight weeks assignment time just to hang out with movie bears in California. Why? Because I was afraid when I went to the wild, the bears wouldn't necessarily care that I was with National Geographic and show up to get their picture taken. So. When I did go to the wild, I went to the most visually loaded place I could, Brooks Falls, a very famous place for a few fishing bears that stand there and catch salmon in midair. But I needed to get more than that because every assignment could be your last if you don't do a great job. So I knew that this was home to the bear paparazzi. I could make a twofer out of this. You stand on a, basically a big patio deck and wait for an hour, and then you're on for an hour, and then you're shoved off. But then when all these photographers go back to their tents and the lodge at night, I'm out there trying for a threefer, laying along the edge of the river, trying to get something nice and close. And I do all this to try to convey this story to you guys. Basically, the story of bears isn't all these wild and sexy pictures. It's this. Bears get into our garbage, they love our garbage, but a fed bear is a dead bear, and these bears that get a little bit more aggressive, they get shy. Turned into bearskin rugs at the state of Alaska surplus sale. That's it. That's the story of bears is they love us. They can tolerate us. We can't tolerate them. Pretty open and shut case. We need to give them more space. Okay, that makes sense. We get it. They're big and charismatic. And what about this? What about wolves? Wolves are a little bit more enigmatic, aren't they? What do you think about wolves? They're complicated. They really are. And we are a society that is so used to being cued every second of the day what to think. You ever watch reality TV? They cue you with music. Every scene, you know whether it's a bad guy coming into the room or a good guy, whether something sad's going to happen or something hilarious is going to happen. They set you up with music. They cue you. They tell you how to think. What do you think about wolves? Are they this? Are they this? Well, wolves just are. They just are. That's it. That's got to be enough. If we're to be thoughtful, if we are to survive as a species, we got to think. My job is to help people think about things. I don't want to tell you what to think, but I do want you to think. Do a story on koalas, lure you in, show you the weird pictures, show you the endearing pictures, get you to think about koalas. Think about, well, why do these human mothers have babies on them? Well, because of that. Where's the koala going to go in northern Australia? The golf course? Live on the fairway? Uh, not, not so much. They've got two or three years worth of koalas left in parts of northern Australia now. That's a problem. Koalas can't handle cars. They can't handle dogs for sure. Dogs take a terrible toll. I did this whole story with all those fun pictures to show you this picture right here. I knew I was going to make this before I even left. The government would not declare the koala imperiled. They would not. They just hadn't for years, even though this is one week's worth of dead koalas all killed by dogs at one health clinic I worked at. The nurses there helped me get this picture because they were outraged at the slaughter going on. This picture runs around the world when Geographic publishes it. It's picked up by wire services. A few weeks later, the Australian government says, yeah, okay, in northern Australia, we'll declare the koalas in peril. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I can't say the picture did it for sure, but it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. So I do these pictures and I do stories on all sorts of subjects to get people just to think, to engage people. Story on migrations. Mountain goats, believe it or not, migrate vertically to get salt off of rocks. The border wall, no matter what you think about that politically, the border wall is bad for animals. They can't get past it. This bobcat took its own picture using a camera trap. Camera traps are something that we use all the time now. This is getting ready to photograph pronghorn antelope. They'd rather crawl under fences than hop over. It's got a little infrared pulse that goes out. Anything breaks that beam, any movement sets it off. So we set that up in Alberta, and we ran it for months, and this is all we got. About 11,000 pictures of tumbleweeds. <laughs> beautiful tumbleweeds. Beautiful, beautiful. That's not what we wanted, obviously. So we ran it a few months more. Geographic has the resources. We can do it, and we get this picture. And then in the caption, this picture can go to work now. It can go to work, and it can say, look, Raise that bottom strand to 18 inches from 12 inches and make it a smooth wire, not barbed, and the pronghorn will get along just fine. There's a common sense solution there. That's great. Common sense solutions. What about wind? 
Everybody loves wind, right? Very clean, doesn't throw carbon into the air, that's true. But some of these turbine fields we're putting up, this is in North Texas, there are a thousand turbines each. A thousand turbines each. Why should you care? Well, gee whiz, you eat fruits and vegetables, they kill a lot of bats that pollinate crops. Bats also eat insects, so do birds. At one turbine field that I went to in Pennsylvania, one turbine's take in one migratory season was 32 bats and five birds a year. That's a lot of bats and that's a lot of birds. And we need to run wind farms at the right times of the day when the wind isn't, isn't mild, when the insects are aloft, that's when the birds and bats go to feed. Under 10 miles an hour, feather out the blades. Don't run them. Over 10 miles an hour, real windy, that's a good time to generate power and the birds and bats aren't aloft as much in non-migratory times and site those fields right. See, this is complicated, complicated subject matter. And I guarantee you, nobody is paying attention. Nobody is. Nope. That's where I come in. Of course, you wouldn't want a National Geographic guy to get up here without talking about Africa, right? Africa. Every story I do, I try to weave in a message. It's not just about the elephants, it's about the dung beetles. I'm looking for unusual. I'm looking for the weird. The weirder it is, the better. Whatever I can. I don't even, I don't even know what this is about, really. but threw it in there. Whatever it is I can to hook people in and get them to pay attention. We run camera traps on water holes and on Cape Buffalo with leopards coming down off of them and hyena dens at night using infrared and we go to windy and penetrable rainforests and we look at the mountain gorillas and it's wonderful. Gorillas are great and your ecotourism dollars help keep those guys alive. They're worth so much money alive they're doing okay. Five, six, seven hundred dollars per person to go watch these guys for an hour. That's money well spent if you ever get a chance. But again, I'm always a little sneaky, aren't I? I'm trying to get this message into the magazine, which we do eventually. This is the story I want to tell. I shoot all those other pictures to get this in. The edge of Queen Elizabeth National Park, farmland on the left, that's the park on the right. The cattlemen don't have any choice. They are so crowded in Uganda with nearly a 5% growth rate in human population a year. Here we go. These guys push cattle into the park. The cattle are killed by lions. The cattlemen pour poison all over what's left of the carcass. The lions come back in to feed the next night and they're all killed. Without your ecotourism dollars, they're going to lose the lion in Uganda in 10 years. Hyenas and other scavengers in about five. That's it. You know, I was hoping when I got assigned to cover the oil spill that we would finally wise up and pay attention to the environment. I was really hoping. I didn't want to go down there. National Geographic sent me. I was down there for three weeks or so, and it's rough, and it smells bad, and it kills a lot of stuff. And we saw that pipe spewing that junk on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico live on CNN for weeks. Remember that pipe camera? Did it change the way we operate a bit? It didn't change us a bit. Why? Because the price of the pump didn't go up, and we don't really care that much. To be honest with you, we want our way of life to remain the same. That was the bitter lesson for me on the oil spill story. And with that, I started thinking a little differently. I started thinking that way a little before then, actually. Now, wherever I go, I take with me black and white backgrounds. And I do portraits of animals that I try to look them in the eye. That guy was going to be made into stew that night. Well, now he's immortal. I'm very concerned about amphibians, especially. Climate change and a fungus that's sweeping the world has put them all at great risk of extinction. Half of all amphibians are going to go extinct in the next 10 years or so. Parts of South America have already lost 40% of their amphibian diversity. Why should we care? That's a great question. Why should we care? We'll talk about that a little bit. This one's down to about eight or nine. Oh, uh, six, three. You're looking at the very last of this one. This is at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. That's the very last Rab's fringed limb tree frog. Very last one. And when I'm there and I'm taking its picture and shooting a little video, I'm thinking, will this make a difference? Will this matter? How many of these will it take to make a difference? What do we have to have happen to get people to care about extinction? And it is coming. It's going to hit us like a sledgehammer. The last dusky seaside sparrow, the last passenger pigeon. We started extinctions long ago. It's not a recent phenomenon. The last Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit. Still, does anybody care? Not the public, not much. How do we get them to care about an aquatic roly-poly bug the size of my fingernail that lives in this hot springs? How do we do it? 
What do we do? With something that doesn't even have eyes, clams, 75, 80% of them are now in need of federal protection. They tell us our water is filthy and still we don't do anything. What to do? I've started this project now called the Photo Arc. And basically what I'm doing is going around and doing these black and white backgrounds because it, it's a great equalizer and it shows the beauty and grace and power in a mouse. He's no less important than a polar bear. That tiger is no more important than a tiger beetle. And so I go and go and go. And the goal now is to photograph all captive species on the face of the earth. Sounds like a big job. In the world, zoos and aquariums. There are about 6,000 species. I've been at this eight years. I've got 2,855 species as of last week. I'll keep going until I drop. I figure another 10, 15 years, if I live that long, that'll get us there. So why? Well, I don't know what else to do. I'm desperate, to be honest with you. I don't know what else to do. Just show the funny things, the very, very rare, the Sumatran rhino. We show the odd, the weird, the unusual. Sure, whatever it takes to get people into the tent. I must get people into the tent. There's no time to lose on any of this stuff. Primates especially, boy, are they being hit hard. Very hard, because they taste good, they're easy to hunt. This is a huge problem. Why should we care? And how do we get people to care? Well, why you should care is, it's folly to think that we can doom half of all species to extinction and not have it bite us very hard. We're mammals, after all. We are species ourselves. We must, must, must get people to care. It's absolutely critical. We do not know how many of these we can kill off without killing off ourselves. It cannot be. It simply can't. But how do we move people to care? That's the question. You notice there are no pictures in here of chimps, not a single picture. I'm going to show you why in just a second. But first, look at these guys. Can we do it? Sure. Whooping crane, 20 birds. Black-footed ferret, 18 animals. Mexican gray wolf, 18 animals. California condor, 21. We can do it. We can save them. We've saved these guys. Most of what you've seen can be saved, 90% of it. But we must pay attention. No chimps. Here's why. What do you think? Is that pretty good? All I can do is hope. They're pretty strong. I hear they could rip your rip your uh, arm off and beat it, beat right. you to death with it, right? Exactly. Yeah, pretty much. So now doesn't this look nice? Doesn't this look nice? How long will that last? 60 seconds? Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say this to sum up. Where do we go from here? Well, here's where we go. I'm going to use my daughter. You counting on that generation to save us all? She's afraid to be more than 10 feet away from an electrical outlet. Forget it. But she can help. She knows that how you spend your money is critical. Big deal, every time you break out your purse or your wallet, you're saying to a retailer, I approve of what this is made of and I want you to do it again and again. That's the power to change the world. Get your kids off the couch and get them muddy. Take them out fishing, even the fit thrower likes that. Do it. <laughs> education, we must, we must mandate environment edu ed education in schools and we have to make it socially mandatory that kids care about the environment and we have to make it fun. We have to make it fun. We have to make the environment as popular as Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber put together. Can we do it? Absolutely. From my front lawn on any home game Saturday in the fall, I hear this tremendous roar, a cacophony of sound and spirit for a football team. And I think, holy cow, if I had 110,000 people that cared that much about something that actually mattered, the future of life on Earth, could we get things going in the right way? Yes, you bet we could. And for those of you who still doubt, listen to the words of Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Great Thank job. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.